to encourage our hearts and our minds and our souls so that we'll want to go on just to see what the end is going to be. Again, Lord, I ask that you might bless him. Bless the preacher of the hour tonight. Bless Pastor Glenn Pettigrew in a great and special way. We ask, Lord, that you might be with him. Allow for the meditation of his heart to be acceptable into your sight. And Lord, we do say thank you. We thank you again for all things. Finally, if we fail to ask for anything in faith, we pray that you'll grant it in grace. And we'll be careful, so very careful, to give you the honor and you the praise. It's in the name of Jesus that we ask this thing. And all of God's people just ought to say,
to once again consider our scripture for tonight. Matthew chapter 22. We read verses 34 through 40. When the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together, and one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? He said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. And a second is like it. Yeah. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. May we bow in prayer. Mm -hmm. Lord God, I pray that your people shall receive a blessing this evening. Lord, help the preacher that he not block the blessing. In Jesus' name, amen. The main branch of the tree. I suppose we could say the trunk of the tree. Two commandments are quoted by Jesus yeah. as the greatest two, and Jesus says in verse 40, on these two yeah. hang all the law and prophets. The law tells us how to serve the Lord, how to worship, and how to live. The prophets are the preachings of prophets, the true prophets, who reminded the people to come back to God who reminded the people of who God is yeah. and what God wants. When we look at the law, too often, too often we miss the first commandment and the second commandment. The first commandment in importance, yeah. the greatest commandment according to Jesus, we just read it, love the Lord your God. Yeah. Too often we miss the second commandment, love your neighbor as yourself. Now Jesus did not make that up. As the Son of God, he would have had the right to say anything that he chose. But notice, if you will, our Bible study people, that when we turn to Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 5, we find Jesus quoting Deuteronomy. Yeah, come on. And when we turn our Bibles to Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18, we find Jesus quoting Leviticus. Now I will make a confession. Confession is good for the soul. I do not generally enjoy reading the book of Leviticus. The book of Leviticus is hard reading. It's hard ground to pull through. But Jesus helps us see what Leviticus is all about. Numbers and Deuteronomy and Exodus as well. Jesus.
Jesus helps us see what the Christian religion is. The Christian religion is a religion. It is a religion. It is a discipline. But it has to be more than that or it is not Christian. You cannot really be Christian without the relationship with God that follows when you do these two things. Much of what is paraded in our world today as Christian and religious may be religious but I dare say, does not seem to be influenced at all by Matthew 22, verses 34 through 40. I had an experience last week that caused this passage of scripture to leap up again and burn within my mind. This is a passage that has been important to me all my adult life and part of my childhood. But it became even more important after a phone call that came last week. The phone call, in essence, was preaching, I want to know what your church believes. For Elder Williams, my mind started racing. Yeah. That can cover a lot of ground. But I was intrigued by the question. Yeah. You see, the caller didn't know me. I don't know if he knew anybody in this congregation. But it's a caller who was interested in finding a church for his family to attend. Yeah. And he wanted to find a church that believed the right things and teaches and preaches the right things. Yeah. Well, that conversation could have gone several different ways. But he also said, you see, it's not enough for me to be around good people. I want to know what the people believe. Yeah. Now, we could have talked about many, many things following a conversation like this. We could have talked about the articles of faith. We could have talked about the principles that I've seen people in this congregation live by and try to live up to and many do another. Good job. Could have talked about the church covenant. Yeah. But on a whim, I decided to ask him whether there was anything in particular uh, yes, yes. that was most important to him. That rang his bell. Yes. You see, there is one particular sin yes. that is most important to him for a church to be against. There is one particular weakness in humanity that's important for him that the church stand against and call all those people involved in that sin yes. to get saved. A whole lot of folk are just like that. A whole lot of folk have one particular sin, or maybe two, that they're against. My mother, who is up in age now, watches religious broadcasting. There's not much else on television, I don't think. But she said the other day, and I heard her say several times, Dr. P, folk on television act like it ain't but two sins. Abortion and homosexuality. Yeah. I said, is there any programs on television that talk about loving the Lord with your heart, your soul, and your mind, and loving your neighbor as yourself? And she thought for a while, and thought for a while, and just shook her head. It's interesting what gets important to people. Even the man asking the question in Matthew 22 appears not to be really concerned 
about the most important commandment in the law as he was in trying to get Jesus into a compromising corner so that the Pharisees could get rid of him, so that the Pharisees could take away his influence and his power and his hold on people because Jesus was causing things to change. And the Pharisees and the Sadducees weren't looking for change. They wanted things to stay like they are. Now the Bible doesn't say word for word that it's a sin to love how you are better than you love God, but it does say, love the Lord with all your heart with all your mind, with your strength. That's the first and greatest commandment. But when you put God first, you leave yourself out of first place. The danger for a whole lot of good folk and a whole lot of folk who are not so good is we want to keep ourselves in first place and we want to make the religion fit yeah. us yeah. rather than seeking to be changed and transformed by the Lord. Yeah. I thought about that talking to that young man. He's not the only one that has his own agenda, her own agenda, and looking to make Christianity mold itself to my opinion and my feelings. All of us have opinions and feelings. Yeah. Right now, I'm not speaking for anybody else, but I'm stirred up myself about some things. But what makes me feel good is when I look in the scripture, the scripture talks about love for your fellow man and your fellow woman. Scripture talks about love for your neighbor. Scripture talks about people being God's people. Scripture doesn't talk about, doesn't talk about some folk were made by God and other folk weren't made by God. Scripture doesn't say some folk who don't steal you can look at me and tell I don't like anybody who steals. Everybody who looks at me will tell you I can't stand a lie and I can't stand a thief. You can go ahead and say amen. You know. But the same God that saved me didn't save me for me to be saved by myself. The same God that saved me wants to save everybody. Yeah, yeah. Not just the folk who do the thing that I think ought to be stopped doing. And there's some awful things happening in our land right now. Right here in Winston-Salem, there's too much violence that we have become violent, violent, violent. And there's too much of it. Children are being killed. People in the, what ought to be the prime of their life are being pulled down by violence needs to stop. That's not the only thing that's wrong. Even those things that we don't like and are obviously wrong hang on the same main tree trunk, the same branch. All of the law hangs on these greatest two commandments. So often when we talk about commandments, we talk about the law. But Jesus not only is talking about the law, he's talking about the law and the prophets. The law is a taskmaster. It's a harsh teacher. The law teaches you. It shows you. And if it doesn't break you down, it'll inspire you. The law does some good things. The law shapes for us a vision of what things ought to look like, yeah. what society, what the kingdom looks like. 
But one thing the law does not do. The law does not save us. Pharisees way was to get rid of Jesus. Jesus was causing change. Jesus was laying out a way for folk to get saved themselves without having to be burdened by Pharisees and having to be drawn around by Sadducees. Yeah. You see, the hope of man's salvation does not rest in what people tell you and teach you to do. It doesn't even rest in the law. The law is good and the law can be useful. But my hope of salvation is, in not, is not in doing the law. But my hope of salvation is in Jesus. Yeah. Salvation that God gives through Jesus is of such that I can't brag about it. I can testify about it, yeah. but I can't brag about it. Because it's not of works, it's not anything that I have done. It's not how good I have been, and it's not what bad I did not do. My salvation comes from the Lord. It is a gift of God. Salvation does not come from my doing the law, but my salvation causes me to want to do the law. I want to do what's right. Yeah. How do you know you've been changed? Do you have a mind to want to do right? Yeah. If you've got a do right mind, you may not always have done right, but just to have a do right mind means that something had to change. And when things change, it's because something acted upon that which has changed. God has done something. God is doing something. Brothers and sisters, one of the things that's so great about these two commandments in my mind is that they function like road signs. When you see yourself loving God with your mind, yeah. with your heart, with your strength. It indicates which way you are turned. When you love your neighbor, when you seek to love your neighbor, I should say, because some neighbors are hard to love. Oh my. Some people I see on television are hard to love. But when I do some of the things that love would cause me to do, because love is not just a feel. Love is an action. You know, I prayed for the president the other day. Yeah. I see that as a sign. What do I see that as a sign of? Well, let me tell you a story about a man who tells me about signs. Yeah. There was a old preacher, he's gone on now, but he told the story of driving along back in the south, back in the day. And it was that night, and he was on a dog road, going somewhere he had never gone before. He stopped at a service station to get gas, and while he was there, he said, Mister, where am I now? And the guy said, Oh, you're lost. He said, no, sir. I'm not lost. I'm on the right road. And I'm headed in the right direction. Yeah. I may not know where I am now, but I'm not lost. Right now, many of us don't know where we are right now. But the greatest two commandments can tell you whether or not you're on the right road. And if you're headed, in the right direction. Yeah. I'm glad yeah. that Jesus gave us this as encouragement and help. I feel like I got, I may not have a map to tell me where I am, but I got a sign to tell me which way to go and what's the right road.
invite you to accept the Lord Jesus as your Savior in here now. To let us know your decision, we invite you to walk with him through this journey of life more close, closely than you ever have before. Thank you. 